<coughs> I was introducing the general subject of this weekend's discussion this morning by trying to describe my own approach to the study of comparative religion and the psychology of religion, saying that I was really in the following of William James, uh, who tried two things, to give a description of the psychological dynamics of religious experience as brought about by what you might really call the various disciplines and concentrating rather heavily on the type of experience which his contemporary R.M. Buck called cosmic consciousness, the state in which the individual has a transformation of his awareness of his own identity and experiences himself instead of being a skin encapsulated ego as a being continuous with the entire universe, the cosmos or its energy. And I went on to say that he uh, made the point that you can't really verify this sort of experience, but uh, you could only test it by its consequences for human behavior. But I wanted to go a step further than that and say that the pragmatic aspect of this sort of experience is not merely moral and social. It is also uh, universal in the sense that the question of man's relationship to his physical environment is one that is now crucial in the middle of the 20th century because our technology gives us the capacity to destroy the planet and not necessarily by atomic fission but by improper ways of attempting to control uh, the natural environment both animal, vegetable and mineral so that more than ever it seems to me of a practical import to go beyond the hallucination that we are separate from the total uh, natural environment and so this brings up the whole problem of the study of religion as not a merely historical matter, not simply a study of museum pieces, but it brings up the study of religion as an experimental inquiry. You know it's a funny thing in the academic world as we've known it for some time, all effete sub uh, sub subjects are taught by the historical method. For example, when you learn mathematics, your initial courses are not on the history of mathematics. When you go to medical school, the only courses on the history of medicine are electives for graduate students, for the or seniors. But you will always notice that beginning religion is apt to be history of religions, beginning philosophy is apt to be history of philosophy, which advertises right away that these are museum pieces. You can also tell a great deal from the size of the department and its position in the general geography of the campus. Uh, we have got a campus set up nowadays where the central building is the administration building, because that's the most important thing going on. Uh, <laughs> in a funny old place like Oxford, you can't even find the administration building. <laughs> so, uh, but now here it comes up a very considerable question. There is a professor at Harvard in the Department of Social Relations, who should be nameless. But a little while ago, when there was a disturbance there, because people were altering their consciousness and studying its effects, he made the pronouncement that nothing which is incapable of being put into words, or rather no non-verbal area, is a proper subject for the academy the university. And I began wondering about the Harvard football team. <laughs> uh, but surely this is a very strange attitude. But it's not a new one at all. We've been through all this before. And long ago, uh, most scientific people were on the other end of the argument. 
because in the 16th and 17th centuries, when Western science really began to get underway, what is not generally realized is that natural science and mysticism, uh, whether it was um, the sort of mysticism of which I suppose you would call theosophy in the original meaning of that word, I don't mean the Theosophical Society, but the theosophy of a man like Paracelsus, uh, or of Nicholas of Cusa, or of um, Van Helmut. This was something which went hand in hand with a curiosity about natural science and an experimental attitude to the study of nature. As you, I don't need to tell you, the theologians who refused to look through Galileo's telescope wouldn't look through it because they already knew what the state of affairs was, because it was revealed in the Bible and in the writings of Aristotle. So you, you got a scholasticism where people were depending entirely for knowledge on the written system, on the verbal system, and they would not put this verbal system to the test of experiment. But the young scientists of the West wanted to read the book of nature. Francis Bacon very strongly criticized scholastics for having a system of great uh, elaborateness uh, he said it's like a spider weaving out of itself webs of great subtlety and precision, but of no substance or profit. And he thought this was conceited, and that one should instead uh, refer to uh, the experience of the physical world. But the trouble with that was, from a scholastic point of view, that it involved getting your hands dirty. Because scientific experiment required manual operations. And this is beneath the dignity of a Brahmin. You have to be a Shudra um, to get into manual operations, or a Kshatriya who fights. But uh, the, the same, we have a tendency now for the same thing to be true. That, look at the curious thing. We all make jokes about two-bit colleges that give courses in basket weaving. And in both high school and college, what you might call practical courses are looked upon, and unless they're in medicine or physics or chemistry or something like that, they are looked upon as uh, something for dropouts. If you're in high school and it uh, looks as if you're not going to be very good at computation or verbalization, they suggest, well, maybe you should prepare for a trade. And uh, alas, rather regrettably, you'd better go into the workshop. Now that's a very curious thing. Because what we're doing by having a form and style of education that is exclusively literate, we are training our children to be bureaucrats, bankers, and maybe a few professional people, or, or even teachers, where the system just turns in on itself. You're training teachers to teach teachers to teach teachers. And as a result of this, our civilization is very seriously impoverished in certain quite fundamental things. Uh, to name a few, uh, by and large, our cooking is abominable. Mm -hmm. Our clothes leave a great deal to be desired. Men's clothes are absurdly uncomfortable, and we all go around looking like funeral directors. And um, housing isn't too hot. Um, nobody gets, really gets particularly educated in the art of love making. And, uh, but all these are very fundamental to the good life. We have a reputation in the Orient and here of being the most materialistic civilization on the face of the earth. It's completely undeserved because a materialist is a person who loves material. And uh, we don't. We're ashamed of it. We want to conquer it, abolish it. We talk about abolishing the limitations of time and space. And as a result of this process, though I will say jet aircraft is one of the few very excellent things that we produce. It's beautiful engineering. And we produce some gorgeous scientific instruments and electronic contraptions. But when we get to more basic things, what happens, you see, is it's like this. 
Uh, when you can go almost immediately and instantaneously from one part of the earth to the other, the two places become the same place. So when you wake up in Tokyo nowadays, you are not quite sure where you are. You're in a strange mixture of Los Angeles, Shanghai, and Paris. And uh, therefore, tourists thinking about going, say, to Hawaii or Japan, they invariably ask their friends who've been there, is it spoiled yet? Now, what does that mean? It means, is it just like where we start out from? <laughs> and if it is, there's no point making the trip. <laughs> because once you obliterate the material dimension, the distance between two places, as I say, they become the same place. If I offer you a banana, you will be very unsatisfied if I offer you just the two ends of the banana. What you want is the, 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 the substance between. Uh, in the same way, uh, when you consider a great many of our products, automobiles that are essentially <coughs> toy rocket ships with built-in obsolescence, um, when you consider fabrics that we use, which fall apart in a hurry, uh, what are we really doing? We say we're practical, but we're not. We're abstractionists, almost like the scholastics because we are making surfaces with not much underneath them. This is a great way of making money, because it's really cheating. When you run the gro go into the grocery business, and you manage to um, make all kinds of imitation food and then inject chemicals, and sell people styrofoam instead of bread. Um, <laughs> well, yes, you may make lots of money. You can also cheat on the packaging by reducing the quantity and making the exterior look very attractive with color photography. And so, but when the difficulty is that when you've made all this money, you have nothing to buy with it except other people's inferior products. <laughs> you have to go outside the country, back to peasants and people like that, who took uh, joy in their work and had a material relationship to it. But this is a serious puzzle, and it all, it all goes hand in hand with uh, an attitude to education that is t too abstract, too scholastic, too much in the head and too little in the belly. Uh, Lao Tzu says in his book, the energies of the emperor should be directed to keeping the minds of the people unpreoccupied and their bellies well filled, which seems an extraordinary attitude for a mystic. You would think he would be all up in the mind, but the contrary is the case. Uh, great mystics, are very well related to the physical world. We think of um, St. Teresa of uh, Avila, of the Zen masters, of uh, great Chinese uh, mystics who were also artists, um, and, we, and, and Hindu mystics who had the most fantastic methods of physical culture. And you realize that it, uh, the, the, the attitude of mysticism is not at all when you really come down to it, and anti-worldly, or as uh, Ing calls it, acosmistic. This is a superstition. Just because they use negative language and may refer on occasion to the world as a maya, or illusion, uh, we forget that the word maya, for example, also means art, magic, and skill. And it isn't necessarily the point of Hindu a spiritual endeavor at all to get rid of one's experience of the world. It may be in some particular emphases of it, some particular schools, but you can't make that a generalization by any means. Furthermore, you will remember that in the most influential form of Buddhism, which is called the Mahayana, that the whole point is that when you've attained enlightenment, instead of going off and disappearing forever into some undiscoverable nirvana, the whole point is that you, as a bodhisattva, come back to work in the world. And that is why Mahayana has been so creative on the artistic level. So there is a very strong bond, you see, between the mystical approach and the empirical approach, since both are interested in experience, and insofar as one realizes the fundamental unity of the cosmos, there is a tendency to do away with the dualism of the spiritual and the physical. I'll never forget uh, when D.T. Suzuki was at the World Congress of Faiths in London in 1936 
we had a kind of final round-up lecture in Queen's Hall. And the subject was that several representatives of various traditions were going to talk on the supreme spiritual ideal. Well, one person got up and another person got up and delivered themselves of incredible quantities of hot air. Finally, little old Suzuki got to his feet and said, I am asked to talk about supreme spiritual ideal. Now I am countryman from very far off place. I do not know what supreme spiritual ideal is. I look it up in the dictionary, but I do not understand this at all. <laughs> <laughs> then he went on <laughs> to give a description of his house and garden in Japan. <laughs> and uh, just everybody gave him a standing ovation. It wasn't exactly what he said, it was his attitude. Uh, and of course, he did say in the course of his observations that uh, what we needed more than anything else was an attitude to life in which the spiritual and the material uh, were inseparable, because otherwise, uh, what influence on the material could the spiritual have? It's the old problem, you know, of if you are made of two parts, one spiritual and the other physical, how does the spiritual part move the physical part, since all good ghosts walk straight through brick walls and don't disturb the bricks? So, in, the, in this way then, when you, when you look back to the origins of Western science, you find that concern for what is to be found by the observation, by getting involved in the physical universe, was of interest to the same people who were interested in uh, an experimental approach to religion. One thinks particularly of that uh, cardinal, Nicholas Cusanus, who was interested in all sorts of scientific uh, investigation, and at the same time uh, wrote the Doctor Ignorantia, uh, the book called Learned Ignorance. Uh, he used it in the sense of unknowing, like the cloud of unknowing. And uh, he was primarily concerned with the whole problem of the relationship of opposites or polarities. He was one of the great thinkers on that subject. So, therefore, it seems to be that a, a serious study of the psychology of religions and of their symbolisms must involve both a literary approach and an experimental approach. It is precisely for lack, you see, of an experimental approach that a great deal of uh, religion and also of philosophy and tr uh, traditional metaphysics has become of so little interest to young people in particular. They want to go further. And this is why young people uh, are to such a great extent interested in expanding or altering their consciousness. It isn't a question of looking for kicks. Uh, you know, we don't take young people very seriously. And when they do something like that, we always say, oh, boys will be boys, they're looking for kicks. And yet, let's say, people of the same age can be sent off on the highly responsible job of fighting in Vietnam. Uh, you just can't have it both ways. If they are uh, responsible enough, mature enough to go and fight our battles, uh, we should allow them some say in uh, the deep and important matters of life. So it is a very puzzling question, though, as to how one might engage in the study of religion experimentally with a scientific attitude and do it within the framework of the academic community as we know it. Because you see, the moment you start experimenting with it, you are suspect of being goofy. It's all very well for Professor X to be a Sanskritist and to know all about Vedic literature and the uh, commentaries on the Gita and have all this at his fingertips. But the moment it's known that he's practicing yoga and that he's got some scientific apparatus to measure the EEG effects of his breathing and of his states of concentration, you see the man's off his rocker <laughs> because he's getting into this non-verbal exploration. But 
This is, once again, though, um, a renaissance of scholasticism that would make this sort of criticism. People tend to think that the, the, the attitude of science makes it perfectly clear that there is nothing more to life than a pilgrimage from the maternity ward to the crematorium. That's what there is. And in this new theology of the death of God, uh, this attitude is exploding into theological circles, uh, many, many years behind the times, one might say, uh, and uh, suggesting that we've really got to face up to it after all, that um, religion is wishful thinking, there isn't anybody up there who cares, and that life is just what we see it to be. It is banal. It is just this uh, so-called practical world, and that we've got to deal with that. So uh, how one manages with this sort of theology to go on being a Christian is an extreme puzzle to me. It's like the joke that somebody made, this theology is saying that there is no God and Jesus Christ is his only son. Uh, <laughs> uh, in other words, uh, the central meaning of Jesus' life was a hallucination. But, you know, always be suspicious of dogmatics of any kind and ask the question, when a person propounds an idea of that sort, what is he trying to tell us about himself? What role is he playing? What kind of an act is this? Well, you realize that in the, when scientism, which I think we must call it, was really fashionable in the end of the 19th century and early in this century, uh, and this, uh, what I've called, fully automatic model of the universe was in vogue, there are some extremely interesting things about its attitude. Remember what it revolted against the conception of God, who was of course dead long ago, which was the old gentleman with a white beard on a golden throne. It was that God that was dead. Uh, it was a very uncomfortable God, in, in this sense, that people were delighted for an excuse to get rid of the thought that they were being watched all the time by a just judge, however loving. You know, when you're in school, and uh, you were a child and um, you were writing and the teacher walked around the class and watched over your shoulder what you were doing even if you liked the teacher very much that always put you off so the sense that there's always somebody watching who knows not only what you do but what you think and feel and therefore you are subject to judgment at every moment that's very uncomfortable so people were most happy for an excuse uh, to have an unintelligent universe, rather than one presided over by this all-prying intelligence. The difficulty was, however, that uh, they sort of threw out the baby with the bathwater, because when they got rid of this god, uh, they were confronted instead with a, stu with a stupid universe. And so uh, this is all, this uh, is reflected in the language of uh, 19th century thinkers, when they talked about the energy of the cosmos being blind energy, when Freud described psychic energy as libido, which means blind and unconscious lust, uh, is what we call reductionism. But what lies behind reductionism? Well, you know, people who like to take that attitude like to fancy themselves as being tough and realistic. Someone up there who cares may be all right for little old ladies, you know, who are feeble-minded and can't face facts. But for a real man, uh, let's have a, let's let's look at this thing. Let's look it in the face. Now you see that is a very different attitude from being open-minded. Some people, I remember an entomologist remarking when von Fritsch discovered that bees had a language. He said, I have the most passionate reluctance to accept this evidence. <laughs> Bees, talk. Why, well, you see, nature was starting to get intelligent again, and that simply mustn't be allowed, because intelligence was something to be found only inside the human skull, and then only as a result of a fluke. And if this fluke was to be perpetuated, 
and man's intelligence and human reason and values were to triumph, then naturally we had to fight nature tooth and claw. And we began this assault on it in the name of scientific naturalism. It's very paradoxical. So, you can see that in this attitude to the world, in this kind of scientism which still prevails with many people as their basic common sense, there is something not altogether impartial. There is a desire to make a point. There is a desire to prove that there are no mysteries. Get rid of mysteries, they bug me. That what's out there is just simply banal. It is mechanical. And you can uh, develop it, uh, science, only you have to go a little further and you'll understand the things through and through and there won't be any more mysteries. And it'll all be perfectly boring. That's not an impartial attitude at all. When we found, for example, and it really penetrated people's minds, that man's uh, world was not the center of the cosmos, what did they talk about it? They said, oh, we're just a little germ of life on a small rock that revolves around an unimportant star on the outer fringes of one of the minor galaxies. What do we matter? What a put down that was, you see. Uh, didn't stop to think that the remarkable thing about this little germ uh, was that n not only could it look at the entire cosmos and think about it, but that by the virtue of its nervous system, it was evoking this cosmos out of something which would otherwise be quanta, which have about the same order of reality as the sound of a hand playing on a skinless drum. You ever heard that thing about the sound of one hand? <laughs> <laughs> Question in Zen? Uh, because we, we realize more and more that it is the complexity of the human organism, and especially its neurological aspects, which is in fact evoking the universe. Uh, you, you can play all you like with your fingers, you see, and uh, make complex tunes, but if there's no piano, no music. So the sun can sh emit energy all it likes, but if there are no eyeballs anywhere, it's never light. Because uh, existence is relationship. So, an open attitude, which is, I think, in the true spirit of science, does not have an axe to grind, that namely, things shall turn out to be banal. Things shall turn out to be stupid and boring, and for heaven preserve us from anything uh, that isn't that way, because it'd worry us. And yet not so long ago, when some rather startling, even if unproved theories were advanced by Velikovsky, uh, pressure was put on his publisher by some very highly placed people in the academic world not to publish that kind of book or they could no longer be regarded as a publisher of serious scientific literature. It was an attempt to censor him because his opinions ran contrary to the accepted fashions in thinking. So, so far as in any institution where these subjects are being discussed, Let's remember one thing. Every academic community requires the presence of a small minority of oddballs, if not it's sterile. See, we never really know who is crazy and who is a genius. Time tells, but at the time it's very difficult to decide. And if we've got interesting crazy people who are not destructive and uh, messy and so on, uh, th there's a fairly good risk on gambling on them because they keep things stirred up. Crazy people uh, are, are, are in a way like innocent children who see that the emperor has no clothes on and, and aren't afraid of saying so right out. They're, they're kind of crazy people will question the most fundamental assumptions that we make. So, uh, heaven forbid that the entire faculty should consist of that sort of people. But there must be one or two of them just to get things going. Uh, it's like this too, you see. Everybody needs to spend a certain amount of time out of every 24 hours, or at least out of every seven days, uh, out of his mind. 
If you are sane all the time, you're unreliable. You're like a bridge that has no give in it. It doesn't sway at all in the wind. It's a rigid bridge. It stands like that, fixed always. And that's a very brittle bridge. In exactly the same way, a...